Good morning, saints of First Christian Church. So today we're going to be discussing a hotly debated topic in our society and within the church. And before we do that, I would ask that we would take some time uh, and pray um, that we approach the throne of God with humility, that as we approach this subject, you may come to find that what you once thought about it was an error. And we must be humble enough to submit to the Word of God and have the Word of God and the Holy Spirit transform us rather than for us to impose and transform the Bible. Let's pray. Father God, I ask as we enter this time of worship, as we enter this time of going through your word, we ask you, Lord, that your word would convict us, would guide us, would humble us, that we would submit entirely to your word, to the Holy Spirit and his conviction, that our lives would align with your word, not as we impose our lives upon your word and change the very words that you have blessed us with. Help us, Father, uh, to face our own bias, to face our own prejudice, or face our own bigotry, that we uh, would humbly serve you and that we would receive your word with great humility. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now today I'm going to be approaching this subject from a Christian standpoint, meaning I'm not trying to convince non-Christians. I'm wanting to address Christians who affirm the subject matter at hand. Today we are going to address the question, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? The approach is to address the objections that are brought forth by affirming Christians, not trying to convince non-Christians. But first, we have to be honest. We have to be honest where this debate really lies. This debate is not actually about homosexuality. The debate is framed that way. In fact, that's the banner that people stand behind, but that's not really what the debate is over. The debate is over 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, fully capable equipped for every good work. This is where the debate is being held because if Scripture is God-breathed and as Christians, we must surrender to the entirety of the Bible, which means we must be prepared to understand and explain the prohibitions in the Old Testament and the New Testament and to submit to it as well. It means that what Moses said, what Paul said, what Jesus said is on the same level of authority. The debates taking place within the church are due to the social change in our society. But really, it boils down to 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. So if you don't believe that the Bible is the word of God, then you're probably going to think that I'm mean-spirited, bigoted, and unloving to LGBT people. But that's because you have placed me in a box. I do firmly and evidentially believe that the Bible is God-breathed, and I take the Word of God recorded within these pages as authoritative in my life and in all image bearers. That does not mean that I have hatred towards my fellow image bearers because they want to sin differently than I do. That assumption to attribute hatred to me is in fact bigoted. That being said, allow me to, to level the playing field. It is a mistake to assume that only homosexuals are challenged in their sexuality upon conversion. No, heterosexuals are challenged by the word of God upon conversion. And I know this all too well. Matthew 5, 27 through 28 says, you have, heard, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The culture had no problem with me watching pornography. But the Word of God, alongside the conviction of the Holy Spirit, commanded me to change my way of thinking about this. In the same way, the debate over homosexuality is not about being gay or whether or not you're acting on gay desires. It is ultimately about the authority of the Word of God. As Christians, it's ultimately our responsibility to submit to the Word of God. As Christians, we've been 
driving people away from the cross. We've been driving people away from from Christ, whether it's due to our own insecurity, our own self-righteousness, or our own bigotry. But and that also needs to be addressed today. But what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Let's go through some of the passages and some of the objections. First, let's go to the Old Testament. Leviticus 18.22, You shall not sleep with a male as one that sleeps with a female. It is an abomination. As well as Leviticus 20, verse 13 says, If there is a man who sleeps with a male, as those who sleep with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. They must be put to death. They have brought their deaths upon themselves. Now first, I want to address the death sentence in Leviticus 20. It stands out. But in reality, the punishment is no different than that of bestiality or heterosexual adultery under the Levitical law. See, God's not singling out homosexuality. He addresses even the horribly depraved actions of bestiality as well as the heterosexual adultery. All of those receive the same punishment. There's not a singling out. And even though we have these punishments laid out on sexual sin across the board, it is still to be done with Deuteronomy 17.6 in mind, which says, On the testimony of two or three witnesses, the condemned shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. The common objection to the Levitical law is something like this. You have a problem with homosexuality, but you wear mixed fabrics. You eat shellfish, bacon. You cut your hair or your beards. Well, some of you do. You have tattoos, and you read horoscopes. Such scenes from the HBO drama The West Wing come to mind. These passages regarding the fabrics, the shellfish, etc., they're found in Leviticus 11 and 19. But the emphasis is on the word abomination. So allow me to address this. This objection shows a lack of any meaningful biblical study on the subject matter. First, there is a difference between the civil, ceremonial, and moral law in the Old Testament. The civil law, these were specifically given to the culture of the Israelites, which includes everything from murder to restitution to dietary restrictions. You also have the ceremonial law. This addresses the customs of a nation. These would have included sacrifice of good animals, the rejection of food sources such as pork, shellfish, and these laws were specifically only towards the Jews. And then you have the moral laws. These relate to the justice and judgment of the people, but they are based on God's own holy nature. And as such, these ordinances are holy, just, and unchanging. The objection that naturally follows is, well, why are some of these still enforced and the others are not? Two reasons. First, the moral law, which is still in effect today, is not some arbitrary social construct, which many try and claim it to be. No, the moral law is defined by the very nature of God. He says, be holy for I am holy. He makes such proclamations in Leviticus 19, 20, 21, and Exodus 19. The moral code cannot change because God's morality, character, and nature does not change. Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3, the first part of verse 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. Second, we know that those laws were not there in the same prominence as the moral law and that they were not permanent. Because scripture addresses this. Matthew 5.17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have, come to, I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill the law. Jesus' words. And this is important because it brings the gospel into light while at the same time addressing why civil and ceremonial law no longer, no longer apply. Words are hard. Galatians 6.24 says, So then... The law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Romans 8, 3 through 4 says, For what the law could not do, 
Weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. It was through Christ's sinless life, death, and resurrection that we are deemed righteous. We as sinners are given the righteousness of Christ upon our conversion because Christ fulfilled all of the law. For example, let's look at dietary restrictions for a moment. Anybody else here like lobster and, you know, shrimp? Yeah? We should probably know this. In Acts chapter 10, the question is, why don't... Christians adhere to the dietary laws. In particular, let's look at unclean animals. In Acts 10, verses 19 through 16. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and wanted to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. I know when I'm praying and I'm hungry, feels like that too. And he saw the sky opened up, And an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground, and on it with all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the sky, a voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, for I have never eaten anything unholy or unclean. Again the voice came to him a second time, What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, because that's kind of the way Peter does things. And immediately the object was taken up into the sky. We see later in this chapter that God was showing Peter that it went far beyond the food. In fact, God shows us it wasn't about the food. Unclean food and unclean people were treated the same way, with aversion and neglect. And that's what the church has done to LGBT people. God's people look down on those who are considered unclean. And in Acts 10, God was not only removing the dietary law, he was explaining to his people that the gospel was now being available to the Gentiles, those who were considered unclean. And this also goes for the other objections, for the clothes, the hair, the tattoos. These things were not meant to terminate upon themselves. We find that what God was pointing to all along was the obedience of his people to obey him and to be set apart from the world. If I had to sum up the civil and ceremonial laws, it would be that way. That his people would be obedient and that his people would be set apart from the world. Deuteronomy 14.2 You have been set apart as holy to the Lord your God. And he has chosen you from all the nations of the, of the earth to be his own special treasure. New Testament, 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through 17 says, Or what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and separate says the Lord, do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you and I will be your, I will be a father to you and you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord almighty. Paul is citing from Isaiah and Ezekiel, both under the old covenant, which we find Leviticus. God has called his people to be different, to be set apart That's where the ceremonial and civil laws have gone, in the conduct and character of God's people. And since we have limited time, I'm halfway through, and we don't have all day. I haven't even gotten to the New Testament, and that's what we need to focus on. I also haven't even gotten to where the the church is to respond to this. So we don't have time to get into creation. God created the male and female. We don't have time to get into Sodom and Gomorrah. And we don't have time to talk about pagan practices which used homosexuality in their idol worship. To recap, all scripture is God-breathed. What we just went through in the Old Testament is God-breathed. And he does not condone homosexual relationships. What about the New Testament? What did the apostles say? What did Jesus say about homosexuality? 
The apostles first. We just went through God's command of his people to be different from the world. We have God's people, we have the world, we are to be separate, we are to be different from the world. And in Romans 1, Paul addresses the world. And in this, we find that God addresses what he has done with the world. Why has God called us to be apart, to be separate from the world? Well, we find it in Romans 1. Romans 1, 21 through 32 says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasonings, and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, of birds, of four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them up to the vile impurity and their lust of their hearts, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for falsehood, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator." who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for that which is contrary to nature, and likewise the men too abandoned natural relations with women and burned in their desire towards one another, males with males committing shameful acts, receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a depraved mind, to those things that are not proper, People, having been filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, and evil, filled with envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unfeeling, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that, they, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they, they, do, they not only do the same, but they approve of those who practice them. This is what scholars call the passive judgment of God. When we look in the Old Testament, we see God say, don't do this or I'm going to punish you. Well, what do we do? We go and do it, and then God brings justice. But here in Romans 1, we see something far more terrifying than fire and brimstone. God says, okay, have it. God created everything that we would be drawn to him in worship. And what the fall of mankind showed us is that man said, forget you, God, I'll do what I want with the things that you have given me. And so I need you to really hear me out on this. When it comes to God's law and God's commandments, we falsely interpret them as him trying to take from our life. When we go back to, say, the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, God prohibits them from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, don't eat from it or else you will die. God did not put that prohibition on it to take from their life. He put it there that they would have a greater intimacy and a greater joy with him. And Romans 1 tells us that God has addressed fallen man and has given them what they wanted. They wanted the world and the sinfulness therein. And instead of God raining down justice right then and there, he said, you can have it. All the while, the world is storing up wrath on judgment day. Romans 1 lists out several sins that I see within the church, and I'd like to go through those one day. But one of these sins listed alongside gossips, greed, the arrogant, the rebellious, is verses 26 and 27. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for that which is contrary to nature, and likewise the men too abandoned natural relations with women and burned in their desire towards one another, males and females committing shameful acts." Paul pretty much just says every word that's offensive in our day and time addressing this subject. He calls it unnatural, he calls it against God's created purpose, and he calls it shameful. It does not appear that the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of Jesus Christ, under divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, supports this kind of lifestyle in any way. But what about Jesus? What did Jesus say regarding homosexuality? The objection that comes up, which you may have heard, is Jesus says nothing about homosexuality. Maybe you've heard that. And again, this claim 
is a sad result of poor biblical exegesis. Matthew chapter 15, verses 17 through 20. Jesus says, do, not, do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and those things defile a person. So what's Jesus setting up? He's setting up that, listen, you're getting caught up on what you're eating. You're getting caught up on the things. I care more about what is coming out of the person than what is going into their mouth. You're getting caught up on eating food from idols. I care about the idolatry in their heart that is coming out. He's addressing what he's been trying to address with Israel from day one is, I require obedience, not sacrifice. And he continues, he says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, acts of adultery, other, other immoral sexual acts, thefts, false testimonies, and slanderous statements. These things, that def- these things are the things that defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the person. Now, in this text, we come across a word. I don't roll my tongue, my, my, my R's very well, so I'm just going to enunciate it. Pornaya. And in this definition of this word, we find every illicit sexual deed. We find adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, intercourse with animals, etc. Sexual intercourse with relatives, sexual intercourse with an unbiblically divorced man or woman. It covers everything from adultery to bestiality. Ah, but they'll say, it means adultery. And that is correct. In fact, in Matthew 5, when Jesus is speaking of divorce, he uses pornaya to speak of adultery in divorce. But you have to read Matthew 15 as a whole. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, acts of adultery, morchaya, a completely different word from other immoral sexual acts, pornaya. Jesus singles out adultery. And so because Jesus has singled out adultery on its own, it removes it from pornaya because he addresses adultery specifically. So what is left on the other side? Every other illicit sexual deed. Once again, from bestiality to homosexuality to lesbianism. Jesus addresses all forms of sexual sin. And just because people will poorly exegete the word of God doesn't mean that Jesus didn't say anything. That is a lie. Now, does it mean that Jesus then went on some diatribe of it? Does it mean that Jesus then took pornaya with adultery removed and said, well, now I'm going to preach a sermon on this? No. But to say that Jesus never mentions it is a lie. But what's even more is Jesus says in the context, he calls adultery, he calls homosexuality, he calls lesbianism, he calls um, bestiality, he calls all of that. In its context, he says this defiles a person. Our Savior, our God, that doesn't sound like the hippie Jesus our culture keeps portraying. He says this defiles a person. But the truth is, for a professing Christian to embrace or practice a homosexual lifestyle, they're living in unrepentant sin. The Bible is clear as it speaks to sin as a whole. It was clear when the Word of God called me out on my porn addiction and lust. And yes, it's a struggle. Yes, it's a fight. It's something you've got to pick up and fight every single day. A couple weeks ago, my wife was gone for two weeks. Those two weeks were difficult for me. I understand how you have desires that do not line up with Scripture and how difficult that can be. But the last thing we should do is change the Word of God to accommodate our desires and what we struggle with. Our desires are not the barometer of godly conduct. The Word of God is the standard. And in that, we have the grace of God to fall upon. There are two sins being committed in the circle of Christianity regarding homosexuality. First is unrepentant homosexual practice. And the, and the second is changing the word of God. Which one do you think I'm more concerned over? The latter. Changing and tampering with the word of God is the biggest problem in Christendom. Since we're talking about opinions, 
I might as well weigh in. I want to address some of the problems I have with the LGBT movement, which I can summarize in one word, defining. The first problem I have with the LGBT movement is people will wrap their identity in their sexuality or sexual proclivity, meaning image bearers of God are rejecting their personhood, which is defined by the creator, and they are placing their identity in their sexual desires. And that is a serious problem. I was talking to my friend Michael this past week, and he said, if I could describe myself in 10 words, being gay would not even be on that list. And he's absolutely right. But that's not what we're seeing in the generation coming up, is it? No, your sexuality is paramount to who you are as a person. No, it's not. To define yourself in your sexuality, you are defining yourself on shifting sands. There's absolutely no foundation in defining your existence as a person and who you are by who you are sexually attracted to. And I would say that to heterosexuals who put their value and their worth in their spouse, who find their meaning and purpose in their job, who wrap their entire existence up in their children. These do not define your foundation as an image bearer of God. And this brings me to the second problem I have. My friend Michael went on to say to me, he said, I think that's why I'm okay with you not being okay with everything I do. I'm thankful that he can see that my love for him is not found in his homosexuality. And this is the other problem I have with the LGBT movement. My love and affection for you is not found in my acceptance of all that you do. If you define love and acceptance by condoning behavior that is according to Scripture destructive to your existence as God's image bearer, then you do not know what love and acceptance means. The problem I have is this defining of oneself and defining of one's loving relationships, which are fatally flawed in this movement. My love for Michael is not going to be found in my condoning, my encouraging, and my participation in a homosexual lifestyle. It's going to be found in my commitment and sacrifice to him. And as a church, we need to be open to keeping our doors and our lives available for people who are struggling with this. We need to welcome them into our home, welcome them into our family, sacrifice for them. That's where our love and acceptance is found because you are a fellow image bearer of God. But this brings us back to the underlying issue. If the Bible is 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, what should be the Christian response? I want to introduce you to two gentlemen that I greatly admire. The first is Christopher Yuan. While he was in graduate school, he developed a drug addiction. And in graduate school, you don't have much money, so in order to feed his addiction, he began selling drugs. So he sold them to classmates, he sold them to friends, he even sold it to a professor. And he said in one of his lectures, I actually thought that I could lead a double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. Three months before receiving his doctorate, he was expelled from school. He moved to Atlanta and ended up being a supplier for, a supplier for several dealers in over a dozen states. When he was arrested, he was charged with the street value of 9.1 tons of marijuana. Christopher spoke of this life saying, it was not uncommon for me to have multiple anonymous partners every day. Now I'll give you a chance to listen to his testimony. I'd recommend you look him up on YouTube and listen. But I also want to tell you about his parents. He had two parents who loved him and loved Jesus more. They didn't know everything that was going on in Christopher's life. They just knew that Christopher needed Jesus. Christopher recalls the fervent love of his mother who fasted every Monday for seven years, one time 39 days on his behalf. She went so far as to pray this terrifying prayer, Lord, do whatever it takes to bring home this prodigal son. Long story short, he came to faith, but it was while he was in prison. He saw this book that caught his eye and he picked it up and it was a Gideon's New Testament and he thought, I have a lot of time on my hands to pass. I might as well do it somehow. Christopher brings it all back to the problem at hand. He says, But as many of you know, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper, 
But we, what we have in our Bibles, ladies and gentlemen, is the very breath of God. Faced with this, Christopher sought counsel from a prison chaplain who said, the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. And he gave him a book on it. Christopher goes on in his lecture to say this, I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. And from a purely humanistic perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way that I was living. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions were a clear distortion of God, his word, and unmistakable condemnation of same-sex relationships. I couldn't even finish the book, and I gave it back to the chaplain. I would encourage you to listen to his testimony. But when I first came across this, I still had questions. I wasn't just satisfied with the Bible says no, not because I don't think that's enough, but I wanted to know, well, how do we minister to our brothers and sisters in Christ who struggle with same-sex attraction? I can understand where the Bible prohibits, but on the ground level, boots on the ground, how do we minister to people? How do we care for them? And that's when I came across Dr. Wesley Hill. He is a minister who has same-sex attraction, but like Christopher Yuan, practices celibacy for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the gospel. Now I admire him because he gives biblical application to this truth. The Bible does not support same-sex relationships. But what he does is he puts it into a perspective that allows us to minister to our brothers and sisters. Two books that he wrote that I would recommend reading, Washed and Waiting, Reflections of a Christian, Christian Faithfulness and Homosexuality. But another one that I would strongly recommend is called Spiritual Friendship, Finding Love in the Church as a Celibate Gay Christian. I'll break it down in my own words, but essentially what he promotes is to build strong, godly, loving friendships with LGBT people. Meaning, females who have the same-sex attraction, that there will be females in the church who will develop a strong, godly, loving friendship with them, and the same thing goes for men. The reason is, is, is for this purpose, that we have an, an, an ingrained desire to have relationship. But what we are doing as a church is we are facilitating that in a biblical and godly way. This gives us the opportunity to minister to them while building them up in Christ and helping them to continue to fight this, this battle, these temptations. And in fact, this is true across the board. This needs to become a priority for us all. When one of our brothers or sisters in Christ is struggling, we need to sacrifice and make time for them. In fact, anyone who is feeling alone, whether the loss of a loved one or moving to a whole new location, it's important that they know that they are a part of the body of Christ. And this brings me to the conclusion of the sermon, which is where the church has failed. Now, I want to make this very clear. It is not Christ who has failed them. We have failed them. And I believe in so doing, we have failed Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the, neither the sexually immoral, pornia, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor, nor the greedy, nor those habitually drunk, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God. And this is where the church has failed. For some reason, we seem to think that our sin don't stink. So allow me to illustrate. Looking at verse 9, we see sexually immoral, pornia, idolaters. Have you ever put anything or anyone in the place of authority of your life, in the lordship of your life? Ever had an addiction, a significant other, your own family? Adulterers, have you ever had an affair, lusted over someone, watched pornography? Thieves, have you ever stolen anything? That includes little Zachary's eraser in first grade. Greedy. Ever craved more, especially that which is someone else's. Habitually drunk. Verbal abusers. Some translations say revilers. Have you ever abused someone with your speech? And swindlers. Have you ever manipulated someone for your own personal gain? Where the church has failed is we seem to think that the Bible only has something to say about homosexuality. 
But we have forgotten, as Christians, probably one of the most beautiful verses of the gospel in all of Scripture. Verse 11. Such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. We've made the mistake of thinking that someone needs to stop being gay before they kneel at the cross. I was a perverted, porn-addicted, angry manipulator when I came to Christ. Did I need to stop my sin before I fell upon his mercy? If I could, if any of us could overcome our sin apart from the cross, then there'd be no reason for the cross. No. We are to come exactly as we are. Such were some of you. That's who you used to be, defined by your sin and separated from God. But someone changed that, didn't he? When Christ entered your life and took lordship of your heart, he got to work, amen? And our LGBT brothers and sisters in Christ are not more sinful than we are, and yet we treat them as less than. For us to treat them as anything less than our own flesh and blood, our own sons and daughters, our own brothers and sisters, means that we have failed one another. If the cross was big enough for my sin and yours, then it is certainly big enough for theirs. The truth of the matter is, is our doors are to be open, our arms are to be open, our homes are to be open. And why? Because our Bibles are wide open. No person is beyond redemption. And no person, no redeemed person will ever surrender to their sin. And lastly, no redeemed person should ever go through their struggle alone. There is absolutely... No biblical basis to support an LGBT lifestyle. But there is also no biblical basis for us to ever drive any of them away from the cross of Jesus Christ. And that is the dilemma. And that is what our society has trouble understanding. That we can hold firm to the word of God that says, this is not right. And yet, we can still love, care for, cherish, and nurture a godly friendship with other people. Maybe this is something that you have to wrestle with. Maybe you have some inner struggle that you're dealing with from whether it's same-sex attraction or whether it's you have this really negative and, 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 or, or this kind of animosity towards the LGBT people. I don't know. Maybe you have... Maybe this just hit nothing today because you have something going on in your life that is weighing on your heart and it is just a miracle you ended up here today. You're worn out, you're tired, whatever the reason may be. During this time of invitation, I want to encourage you, if it has nothing to do with this sermon or if it has everything to do with the sermon, I want to encourage you to meet me in the back and allow us to minister to you, to pray with you, and to help you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the conviction of your Holy Spirit that we would grow closer to you. We understand, Father, that, that your commands, that your word, that your conviction is not meant to, to take away from our life, but to give us a life that is full, that is new, and that is closer to you. I pray, Lord, that you be with us as we address your word and, and, and certain topics like this that are very difficult. When our culture says one thing, when we have professing Christians saying something that is completely unbiblical or something that is completely untrue, it really gets in the way of the true gospel. Help us, Father, to work through any of the struggles that we may be having. I pray, Father, if there's anyone here who is struggling with same-sex attraction, that we would be able to, to come close to them, that we would be able to love them and nurture them in their Christian walk. And Lord, if there's anyone here who has any sort of indignation towards the community, I pray, Father, that you would convict us, that we would be arms open, not condoning of sin, but that, that we would open up our lives, that we could love people in spite of sin. I know for a fact, Lord, I still got plenty of sin in my life, and I am very much loved by this church. I pray, Father, that you bring more people, that we can love them and care for them, 
and call them to a deeper walk with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.